So sports imaging in the pediatric knee is kind of a specialized and very broad topic. So luckily um, they gave me a lot of license to pick what I wanted to talk about. Um, so I have no disclosures. We have three objectives today. So we're gonna identify some basic anatomy on knee radiographs. We're gonna briefly talk about some normal variants that might give you pause when looking at an X-ray. And I'm also gonna show you some case examples of chronic and acute injuries to help you develop a radiographic search pattern um, that's particular to like the adolescent pediatric knee. Um, this is our outline of how we are going to accomplish that. So um, this is a busy slide with lots of images, x-rays and MR images of kids from birth to 18 years old. Um, and these are all normal knees. And I think this really highlights that there's a lot of change happening in these knees, which presents a lot of opportunity for very unique um, injuries and injury patterns that we see in our teenagers, um, particularly those that participate in sports. And I think that it's worth mentioning that often in kids that the bone is actually weaker than the ligament or the um, tendon that is attached to it. And then somewhat um, cruelly, the bone is often weakest just before it finishes growing and fusing. And that um, period of final growth and fusion coincides with uh, mid to late adolescence um, and increased participation in sports. And also you are dealing with kids that are bigger and able to generate a lot more force and a lot more power and a lot more velocity. Um, a lot of the injuries, in fact, all the injuries that I'm gonna talk about today are more common in boys. And some of that does have to do with this type of sports that they participate in. But I also want you to remember that boys and girls um, uh, reach skeletal maturity at different times. So girls uh, mature faster than boys. And so, um, you know, a 13 year old girl may have closed growth plates and a boy would have open growth plates. So even though they experience the same mechanism of injury, um, their bodies are gonna respond to that differently. And I think to sort of drive that point home. Um, so these x-rays are of two different patients and I think you would have a hard time finding 10 differences between them. These are very similar looking x-rays. One of these is from a nine-year-old girl and one of these is from a 12-year-old boy. Um, so just to make sure we're all on the same page with our terminology, um, when we talk about a growing bone, particularly a long bone, these are the parts of the bone that we're gonna talk about. So everything centers around the physis or the growth plate. Um, and then the articular surface down across the physis is the epiphysis. On the other side is the metaphysis and the shaft of the bone is the diaphysis. Um, the apophysis is a fun term and that is a secondary ossification center in a long bone that typically doesn't contribute to longitudinal growth or weight bearing, um, but is often the site of a ligament or tendon attachment. So the tibial tubercle is the apophysis in the knee that we'll be talking about, but some other great examples would be the calcaneal apophysis in the heel or the greater trochanter of the proximal femur. And then just a reminder that the patella is actually just a giant sesamoid bone. Um, this has been covered pretty extensively today, but just to make sure we are all 100% on the same page, we have the femur, the tibia, the fibula, and then this is where the patella sits on the AP view. And then here it is, of course, laterally. Um, a more granular look at the knee, this is an AP projection. So the fibula helps us locate the lateral side of the knee. So this is the lateral femoral condyle, and then you come into the intercondylar notch, and then the medial femoral condyle. And then this sort of, this part of the tibia is um, sort of oval shaped, and that's the tibial plateau. And then this little mountain range in the middle is the tibial eminence, or sometimes referred to as the tibial spines, and those will be important landmarks um, on our radiographic evaluation today. And then the lateral, of course, you've got the bones, but the lateral really gives you a window into the soft tissues of the knee. So when we look at x-rays, we tend to focus on the bones, but um, with an appropriately exposed radiograph, you get a really nice look at the soft tissues. So we'll start up here. So this sort of gray shadow, coming into the top of the patella is the quadriceps tendon. And right behind that is the suprapatellar recess, this kind of gray area. And that's a potential space and that's where joint fluid tends to accumulate. So when you're looking for a joint effusion, this is the place you're looking for it. Um, down here, this diamond shaped gray area is called Hoffa's fat pad. It's just a normal anatomic um, sort of fat as a space occupying um, process. And if it looks too white, 
that's sometimes an indication that there's edema in that region um, related to an injury or inflammation in the um, structures around it. And then the patellar tendon, I know we've talked a lot about it today, but it's very important in acute and chronic knee injury. So it runs from the inferior patella um, down to the tibial tubercle apophysis, which um, I think deserves sort of a special mention. So the tibial tubercle is there um, always. It's just cartilage when you're little. Um, about the time you turn 11, it will start to ossify. Um, that process is typically complete around the time um, you're 14, and that's also when the growth plates um, begin to close. So you can see that progression um, radiographically here. So the tibial tubercle um, undergoes a lot of stress because every time you bend your knee, the patellar tendon is pulling on it. So it's made, it's attached to the underlying bone by a fibrocartilaginous cartilage, which is very strong, but our bodies can't turn fibrocartilaginous cartilage into bone. So um, right before fusion, that fibrocartilaginous cartilage actually changed over to a columnar cartilage, um, which is great because it can be ossified, but is also terrible because it's very weak. And so that predisposes kids to um, some particularly savage looking fractures of the tibial tubercle um, during that time. Um, so if this seems like a lot to you and you just wanna know what to order and like let um, the radiology people take care of the rest of it, um, for most things, you really just need um, an AP and a lateral tube view is a good place to start um, for pain or injury in the knee. Um, but there are a couple of situations in which you need more views than that. Um, one is if you suspect that there's been a patellar dislocation, um, you wanna add a special patellar view. There's like 40 ways to obtain this um, in the x-ray room. Sometimes it's called a merchant or sunrise or horizon view, but this is what it looks like. So this is the medial side of the knee. This is the lateral side of the knee. This is the trochlea, or sorry, this is the patella and it sits in this trochlear groove. And this is a traumatized um, knee um, with some findings we'll talk about later. And then like Dr. Bray mentioned, if you're worried about osteochondral lesions, osteochondral defects, anything like that, you wanna get that tunnel view to really get a nice look at those posterior femoral condyles. Um, so if you're still with us and you want to talk, um, learn a little bit more about knee x-rays, we will move forward. So we're going to really quickly run through some normal variants and then um, just remember that not everything that presents as trauma is trauma. Trauma is a great way to unmask underlying lesions, okay? So first we have our normal variants. So we've talked some today about fuzzy bones. The distal femoral epiphysis, or this bone right here, is particularly prone to looking very irregular. Um, you're going to see that sort of in your preschool to like mid to late elementary age kids. By the time you're looking at, you know, adolescents and high velocity sports, typically that has resolved. Um, a bipartite patella can sometimes mimic a patellar injury. Only 2% of the population has a bipartite patella. Um, of those, the most common is the superolateral. Um, so I think, I don't know if you guys can really see that, but right there um, in the superolateral quadrant of the patella, you get a secondary ossification center that never fully fuses. Um, you can also have just the lateral patella, so just this whole side. And then the most rare is the inferior um, variant. That's like less than 1% of all bipartite patellas. So extremely uncommon, but it can cause some difficulty when you're looking at x-rays. And then the cortical desmoid um, deserves special mention because you're going to hear it mentioned in x-ray reports. And when you see it, um, you're gonna be scared because it sounds like a really terrible bone tumor and it can even honestly look like a really terrible bone tumor taken out of context. So this is the posterior distal medial femoral condyle and the medial gastrocnemius originates there and it just constantly pulls on the bone and causes some remodeling and um, irregularity. And this is very commonly seen. It's completely asymptomatic. It does not cause problems. It does not need follow-up. It does not need an MRI. It is not why their knee hurts. Um, and you'll see this from adolescence into adulthood. Um, just remember, cortical desmoid sounds scary. Nothing to worry about at all. Um, so here is a nine-year-old girl who came into the emergency room with pain and swelling in the knee after a soccer game and they get an x-ray and this is what we all dread. Okay, so there's this 
sclerotic lesion replacing the femur with um, elevated periosteum here. That's a Cobman's triangle up here. And you can see this um, extra osseous sort of bone formation and a large extra osseous tumor with mass effect. And this was an osteosarcoma. So just remember that not everything that presents as trauma is trauma. So overuse injuries, stress fractures, we've heard a little bit about today. They're certainly not unique to the adolescent population, but they are increasing in incidence. I think when you have a runner with you know, shin pain, that's the first thing everybody thinks of. But remember that stress fractures can be seen in any athlete, um, particularly with vigorous training, single sport um, training. And what you have is you have abnormal stress or repeated stress on normal bone. And the body's response to stress on the bone is to remodel it to make it stronger. But to remodel, you have to get rid of everything, right? And so there's a resorption process followed by a um, reformation process. But when you don't give the body a break, when there's just like stress, 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 stress every day, the resorption process really outpaces the um, bone formation process and you get a stress fracture. So early in the process, the x-rays will actually be normal. Um, you cannot see anything and you'll see some edema on MRI. Um, the earliest radiographic sign of a stress fracture is periostitis. We usually see it along the posterior aspect of the proximal tibial metadiaphysis, so in this vicinity here. And then um, if the stress goes on, um, the bone changes will progress radiographically to where we can actually see this sclerotic band and a frank fracture line. And this is that same child's MRI that was got for um, a totally different reason. And the tech saw this in the field of view and just um, got us a couple of images of it. But you can see this, this is a dark, this T1 and T2 hypo intense line right there with some adjacent edema. And so this is just your standard um, tibial stress fracture. The major differential would be shin splints. Um, and you can see um, MR changes in shin splints. That's normally more like it runs sort of along the tibia, like up and down longitudinally and not across. Um, so Osgood Slaughter, we also have talked about today, you see this in your repetitive jumper athletes um, and it's a traction um, or a pulling apophysitis. So inflammation of an apophysis in this case of the tibial tubercle. So, um, radiographically, what we're going to look for is this is that patellar tendon, and we want to look to see if that's thickened. And then you want to look in this Hoffa's fat pad here, down low particularly, and in the fat over the distal patellar tendon to look for signs of um, swelling. So it's just too dense, too white on x-ray, and there may be some like fullness over the tubercle that you can actually see on x-ray. And then the last thing that we look for is fragmentation and sclerosis in the tubercle itself. Um, and the reason that we look for the bony changes last is because even a normal tubercle can sometimes look really funky. Um, and just because it looks funny, if there's no secondary signs of swelling or pain, then we um, typically don't call it radiographically. Um, MRI is really rarely gotten for this um, entity because it's very clinically um, obvious once you get the x-ray. Um, but when you do, you see edema in all three, the tendon, the soft tissue, and the bone. Um, now at the other end of the patellar tendon, um, so this is a sagittal MRI, so this is the femur, this is the tibia, this is the patella. So this is the patellar tendon, um, this is a T2 fat sat image. Um, <laughs> you can see this traction apophysitis um, of the lower patella. So basically the patella just like pulls constantly on this, on uh, the patellar tendon pulls constantly on the patella as it's forming. And you get that thickening in the tendon, the adjacent soft tissue edema and edema in the bone. Um, there are some pitfalls um, and differentials when you're dealing with this from a radiographic standpoint. Um, I mentioned there is the possibility of an inferior patellar ossification center, but that's extraordinarily rare. Um, you can also have a patellar sleeve avulsion fracture that may look very similar on x-rays, but usually the history is very different. So an acute injury usually presents like acutely with an extensor um, deficit. And then jumper's knee is something that you see in a skeletally mature child. So once the bones have already completely formed and fused, and that's just a simple patellar tendonitis without any um, bone changes necessarily.
Um, now we're going to move into some mixed um, overuse and acute injuries. And I think Dr. Bray did a really good job of talking about osteochondral abnormalities. Um, from a radiographic pers perspective, um, what we often describe as osteochondral lesions. Um, and there are several ways to get to that. That's sort of a radiographic endpoint. Um, and there's multiple ways for that to happen. So the first way is to have an acute displaced or impacted fracture. Um, you can have osteochondritis desiccans that leads to an osteochondral lesion and then um, more rarely in pediatrics and certainly not related to sports, you can have um, collapse of the subchondral bone related to avascular necrosis. Um, so we'll start by looking at these acute osteochondral fractures. Um, these are an acute high impact in, um, injury. Typically they present, you know, immediately after the injury with severe pain and swelling, perhaps inability to bear weight. These kids you may see like in the emergency room type of thing. Um, and so um, this child came in and you can see the radiograph here. There's a large osseous defect from the lateral femoral condyle, very, very irregular. Incidentally, he has a uh, type 2 bipartite patella. Um, and then on MRI, you can see this is a sagittal image and there's the large defect there. And then on the coronal images, there's a large defect here and here. And then your goal as the radiologist is to find the missing piece. So when they go on arthroscopically, they need to know like, where do I need to go look for this? Because some places um, you know, you got to really go find it. And so in this case this is a really large fragment and it has um, relocated itself over into the medial joint space. Um, this is an example of osteochondritis desiccans, like she said, chronic repetitive micro trauma, um, disordered subchondral bone formation, um, followed by overlying cartilage damage. So in the acute osteochondral fracture, you have like an impaction at the articular surface. So like the cartilage breaks and then the bone breaks, right? But this is more like, I think of it as like a sinkhole. So like the earth, like underneath the surface goes bad and then like ultimately the surface will collapse. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's just the way I guess I think of it. Um, and that can, you can even have that whole piece come out, right? Like a totally displaced um, fragment. So on x-ray, you really wanna look at that posterior aspect of the medial femoral condyle. Um, and then the other locations are less common. Um, you can see just a little bit of lucency and irregularity, which I think um, in this child, this is sort of a more mild radiographic presentation. Or like in this case here, you can actually see like this full like displaced, um, you know, like a whole separated bone fragment with lucency all the way around it. Um, MR is obtained pretty routinely to look for signs of instability or to evaluate ongoing healing. And then um, like was just discussed, there is a pitfall of an ossification variant, but that's usually seen in much younger children and there are some MR um, findings that we can use to tell the difference between the two, but I will not get into that today. So here's a nice example of some osteochondral um, lesions as the end result of osteochondritis desiccans. So this is a right knee and these are MR, the right knee, and this is the left knee, and these are MRs of the left knee. So there's a little bit of motion um, here in this x-ray, but you can see this oval sclerosis with this surrounding lucency and then the corresponding abnormality on MRI. You can see this very disordered appearing bone and there was a full thickness cleft in the cartilage filled with joint fluid, which certainly makes this lesion at risk for becoming, um, for instability that it could eventually come out of the original location. And then on the left knee, um, you can see a defect here and then you can see this sort of like um, rounded shaped um, ossification. And so that has already displaced into the joint space. And on the MR, um, what you see, you, ex you see what you would expect to see. So there's a large defect here. So the cartilage and the bone is missing from that uh, femur. And here it is in the coronal view. And then this actually, you can't really tell from this image, but that is that fragment that has displaced into the anterior joint space. Uh, patellar dislocation is a very interesting um, disease um, or process. So there's really like two ways. 
are two varieties of patellar dislocation. So the first is you have like a totally anatomically normal knee that takes usually a pretty high velocity direct impact and it just knocks the patella um, out of the trochlear groove. And a lot of times I've seen that with like a helmet to the knee type of injury. And then you have kids that have some kind of underlying malalignment. The bones are not shaped exactly correctly or maybe they're rotated with respect to one another and the patella doesn't sit nicely um, in there. And so you will get some, uh, the, the patella has a tendency to dislocate. Um, and so they can dislocate their patella just as simple like standing up from being seated um, or in non-contact twisting injuries. So this is where we really want to see that patellar view. Um, and in this case, this is um, that patellar view that we saw earlier, and this is it combed in. You can see that irregular fracture along the medial um, patellar facet. And then if you're really carefully looking, you can see there's also a fracture of the lateral femoral condyle. So what happens in a dislocation is the patella like swings out laterally like this, and then on the way back into its normal location will slam into the lateral femoral condyle, and that's when you have your osseous um, injuries occur, and then it comes back in here. Um, here is an example of an MRI um, with their, um, this child had underlying malalignment, and they had recurrent laxity on both sides, and they're ready to have something done about it. And so here we see this brightness in the bone, the medial patellar facet, and the lateral femoral condyle, and that indicates there's been a recent um, dislocation relocation injury without a fracture. And then here you can see on the left side how bad this malalignment is. This patella is very substantially tilted and subluxed laterally. And here's another case um, where a child had recurrent laxity. And you can see even on the x-ray, the patella should sit in this location and is laterally subluxed. And in this case, this is a sort of chronic partially healed fracture. And then they have an acute fracture that you can see here and here, and you can see that large defect from the lateral femoral condyle there, and it's displaced out laterally. And this is just another look at that defect um, on the sagittal view. So we'll move into our acute injuries, which are um, uh, uh, maybe not as interesting uh, because they don't get as many MRIs, but um, they still have some pretty impressive radiographic looks to them. So the tibial tubercle avulsion fracture usually results from forceful contraction of the quads. And basically the quadriceps contracts and the force is transmitted all the way down to the distal end of the patellar tendon. And when you've got that, um, that fibrocartilaginous um, cartilage has turned into columnar cartilage, it's very weak and it will just pull right off. So radiographically, you can just have elevation of that distal tip of the tubercle, um, or that fracture can propagate um, posteriorly into the physis there, or actually like this one did more superiorly into the, um, through the epiphysis and into the articular um, surface. Um, usually just radiographs are all that we see ordered by MRI. Um, could help you better define other associated injuries if you needed to. Um, at the other end of the patellar tendon, um, we have the patellar sleeve avulsion fracture. So again, this is usually a very forceful contraction. And the patella, just like any other bone in the body, is partially cartilage. Um, and then it becomes more and more ossified as time goes on. So a lot of times there'll still be a little bit of cartilage here along the inferior aspect. and you can avulse that from the underlying bone. So the radiographs can be tough. Sometimes you can't, what pulls off of the patella is not actually ossified yet, and it's fully cartilage. So you might see a lot of swelling and then the patella is riding a little bit high, um, but that may be all you see. Um, in other cases like these two, if you would believe me, these are two different children, you can actually see the fracture fragments um, of voles from the patella, and there's a large amount of soft tissue swelling here, right? This patellar tendon is very thickened, and there's joint effusions in both of these kids. So MR can be used for problem solving and looking for associated injuries, um, but is often not needed clinically. Um, so your tibial eminence avulsion fractures 
are um, an ACL tear equivalent injury in a, in a typically in a skeletally immature child. So you see them with the same mechanisms that you see ACL tears in. So decelerations and internal rotations and in severe hyperextensions. And um, remember I said that the ligaments are sometimes stronger than the bone they're attached to. And that's the case here. And so instead of the ACL tearing, um, the ACL actually just like pulls off some of the tibial bone um, at the tibial eminence or tibial spines. So radiographically, this can actually be a very subtle finding. Um, you have to look very closely at these tibial spines and tibial eminence to detect this. And this one would be hard to know unless the clinical history was like ACL deficient knee, but there is actually a fracture here. Um, and with the swelling and things like that, it can be very hard to see. Um, but the MRI is important because it helps us uh, stage these fractures. So you want to evaluate whether the posterior hinge is still intact. So did it just simply elevate the bone or is it actually like completely displaced? And then you also want to look and see if anything from the joint was able to slip into that gap. Uh, because just like, you know, a fracture in the ankle, if a tendon gets in there, it's not going to heal correctly. Um, so you want to look for that and then you want to look for associated injuries. So when an adult has this type of fracture, they usually have like a really, really trash knee. Um, but in kids, um, about 40% of them will have an associated injury and it's usually a meniscal tear and that can be addressed when this fracture is being fixed. Um, so this is our last acute injury. I guess it's almost Halloween, so I've got to scare you a little bit. Um, I know this isn't a knee, this is a femur, but just keep in mind that children don't typically break their femurs like, you know, playing, you know, little league and running around the playground. So if you ever have an injury that seems very out of proportion to the mechanism, um, then I want you to very closely scrutinize the bone for an underlying lesion. So most of the time in the lower extremities and kids, it's a benign lesion. It's usually some kind of a bone cyst or non-ossifying fibroma that's weakened the bone. And that's what this is. This is just a bone cyst. Um, but you obviously can't see this with malignancy. So not everything that presents as trauma is trauma and not everything that presents as trauma is only trauma. All right. so. Last thing, we're just gonna review our search pattern for the pediatric knee. So number one, we have the medial patellar facet and the lateral femoral condyle. That's where we're gonna look for the bone injuries seen in patellar dislocation relocation. Um, number two is that central part of the medial femoral condyle where we're gonna look for osteochondritis desiccans and osteochondral lesions. Number three is the tibial eminence where we're gonna look for that um, eminence avulsion fracture, which is that ACL tear equivalent. Um, number four is the inferior patella, and you're going to be looking acutely for a patellar sleeve avulsion fracture, and for the more chronic presentation, Sendig, Larson, Johansson. And then number five is that tibial tubercle apophysis, so acutely you can have a tibial tubercle avulsion, or chronically you can have Oshkosh-Slaughter disease. And that is it for me.